High up in the mountains of Wanxi province, a dragon sleeps. Its backbone forms the Longshen terraces, carved out of the mountainside long before Columbus ever reached America. For centuries, the Zhong people lived in almost total obscurity, harvesting their crop of rice each year on land no one else would cultivate. Until they were discovered by the tourist industry. Overnight, the dragon's backbone became one of the top 10 scenic spots in all of China. And that has changed everything. Tourist dollars give the locals access to all the things they've dreamed about. But only if they have something the tourists need. Like a hotel. Or a restaurant. But where does a poor farmer get that kind of capital? Many villagers have left to work in coastal factories and send money home. The few who've stayed are mostly older folk who can't get hired on assembly lines. The women carry tourist luggage up the endless steps to the hotels atop the terraces. It's brutally steep, hot, and they have to fight for every bag. The men do the construction work. They build everything by hand. No power tools. And not a single nail. In 2002, there were three guest houses in this tiny village. Now, there are over 300. Longsheng will never look the same. But it's more than just appearances. All over China, two worlds are colliding. On the one hand, newly wealthy Chinese <laughs> with their cable cars, well-dressed children, city shoes, and a lifestyle that is completely baffling to their rural counterparts. A week's wages to get your feet clean by a bunch of fish. But those same villagers are still prepared to work extraordinarily hard to get their hands on some of that newfangled stuff. For themselves, and for their children. Even if they're not sure exactly what it all means. But modernization comes at a price. Families separated by too many miles for too many years. And Longsheng no longer has enough water to go around. All those tourists are drinking the fields dry. Ironically, locals are now so busy earning tourist dollars that they no longer have time to plant the fields, which is exactly what the tourists have come to see. Bree remembers life before the tourists arrived and is determined to do whatever it takes to become a part of China's newfound prosperity. Four generations of Ri's extended family live under the same roof. Her dad, <laughs> mom, his dad, the family patriarch, her two children, and several relatives. Ri's husband works in a factory on the coast. They only see him for one week a year, 
but they're hoping he'll be home for good in 2026. Here's the family plan. Ree's father is building a hotel. Her mother takes care of the grandchildren and cooks. And Ree carries tourist bags to help pay for it all and helps out with household chores. They never stop working and live very frugally. Though she can't help buying modern toys for the children now and then. Bree's grandfather is 81. He spends his day playing with his grandchildren, tending the fire, <laughs> and enjoying the occasional cartoon. He hardly ever speaks. What must he think of this brave new world his great-grandchildren are growing up in? Two hundred and fifty million rural Chinese, like Rui's husband, have already headed for the coast. It's a grueling journey. The lucky passengers have seats. Some have booked cheaper, standing-only tickets. And this ride is three days long. Plenty of time to look out the window. This is what China is becoming, sprawling for mile after mile. There's no dining carriage, but there's plenty of hot water for tea and noodles. After a day or two, the garbage really piles up. Just when everyone is starting to get bored, the entertainment arrives. He's a train employee selling self-cleaning miracle towels. He's very persuasive. Everybody buys. If your train stops long enough, then you can hop off and grab a bite to eat at the food stalls outside the station. This is the ultimate Chinese street cuisine. Fresh, local ingredients. Made to order. Though the water may not be completely clean. They're a husband-wife team, and they're out here seven days a week. It's beastly hot. But it could be worse. The roving sellers have to carry everything on their backs. Though they still can't afford to slack off, there's plenty of other vendors gunning for their clientele. The skewered meat seller, the fresh fruit cart, and comfort foods from every corner of China. Even Uyghur bread, baked in a traditional tanur oven from the country's far western provinces. And if your shoe should lose a heel, or your suitcase a wheel, there's a place for that as well. There's even a roving food cart tire repairman. If you don't have those kind of skills, you can still find a job in Shenzhen. 35 years ago, Shenzhen was just another poor fishing village on the banks of the Pearl River, across from Hong Kong. Then, in 1980, 
Deng Xiaoping launched one of the boldest economic experiments of all time, turning Shenzhen into a special economic zone and kickstarting capitalism in China. Shenzhen is now a sprawling megacity of 18 million people. And this is the engine that powers it. They're part of the largest migration in human history. Two-thirds of Shenzhen's workers are members of China's floating population. Illegals that have no access to local services. They call Shenzhen the city without memory. Everybody comes from somewhere else. This migration is the single most important phenomenon shaping China today. They're drawn here by the chance to earn a salary. Though it's a lonely life. Some of them buy birds. Their chirping reminds homesick urban workers of their more peaceful country lives. But one of the most highly prized pets in China is, in fact, a bug. Crickets can get quite tame, though you'll have to work fast. They only live about three months. It's a thousand-year-old tradition. Royal concubines once kept crickets to ward off loneliness. They're also believed to bring luck, good health, and prosperity. So restaurants often hang them outside their front doors. But many Chinese are looking for a special kind of cricket, one that can win a fight. The place to find those is One Young Pet Market in Beijing. Why are cricket fights so popular? Because many Chinese love to bet on things, like what happens when two insects go to war. But how do you know if you have a champion bug? The strongest fighters apparently have thick necks, bright eyes, big jaws, and most importantly, long and flexible antenna. Though most of these just look half dead to me. A fighting cricket can cost as little as a buck fifty or as much as eight thousand dollars. Serious cricket owners make the yearly pilgrimage to northeastern Shandong province, known to produce China's most celebrated insect warriors. Once you have your cricket, you'll want to feed it a winning diet like ground shrimp and dew collected between 4 and 5 a.m. Cages can be quite elaborate, though mostly crickets just like to stay warm and dry. Until it's time for them to fight. This is just a practice round for training and evaluation. They use thin blades of straw to get them riled up. They bite, butt heads, and try to throw each other out of the ring. The loser usually flees. If it's a tie, then the loudest chirp wins. An enormous amount of money changes hands. $10,000 bets are common. Behind closed doors, of course. Gambling is illegal in China. And insect doping is a serious problem. In a real match, they'd weigh each cricket to make sure it was an equal fight. Winners get names like Red General or Purple Tooth King. Losers, and those that don't want to fight, may take a one-way trip to Beijing's night market, where bugs are center stage. Though most Chinese know to leave the deep-fried spiders, centipedes, 
and scorpions to the tourists. They're hollow and taste like low tide. Beetles and cicadas too, though they tend to have softer insides. The sheep penis is equally inedible, unless you have a fondness for shoe leather. Silkworm pupae are actually quite tasty, like balls of tofu that take on the flavor of whatever sauce you cook them in. Beijing's market is mostly for tourists, but many Chinese have learned to be extremely creative when it comes to food. As I discovered in Guiyin province, on the lovely Li River. Locals have fished these waters for over a thousand years. Though lately, the explosive growth of riverside towns like Yangshuo has threatened both the river and their way of life, forcing many to move aboard their boats. These once quiet waters now swarm with tour boats. Tourism brings jobs, trash, and traffic. But in this case, it's also caused the fish stock to crash. In 2011, the government forbade net fishing for several months each year while they tried to restock the lee with fingerlings. Faced with no way to feed their families, a few of the more ingenious fishermen decided to revive an ancient tradition, using birds to fish. Cormorants, to be exact. Though they quickly realized they could make more money showing tourists than they do from selling the fish. The birds are raised by hand, half slave, half pet and are reasonably tame. He starts by tying a thin cord around the bird's neck. This prevents it from swallowing larger fish. Cormorants have been used in Asia to catch fish for well over a thousand years. Each bird weighs over 10 pounds. Their short wings and webbed feet propel them through the water like missiles. But they can't fly particularly well. They hunt together like wolves. A team of cormorants can catch 20 to 30 large fish in an evening. Once they've caught a fish, he pulls them in and relieves them of it. Cormorants are supposed to be quite smart. These guys know when their master has had too much to drink and take full advantage. I wonder how many times each fish is getting eaten. Once they're done, he unties the string around their necks leashes them. They have an interesting relationship. Those beaks could really do him harm. 
but they hold back. <laughs> and so does he. <laughs> they have to dry their feathers out immediately. Cormorants don't secrete protective oil, so they can die of cold. And then they finally get to eat. It's astonishing how much they can swallow. Unless he's forgotten to untie the string. A few creative fishermen have come up with an even better way of making money. Why bother catching fish when all you really have to do is cook them? They invite tourists onto their liveaboard boats for an evening meal. The view is stunning, though you probably don't want to know where the food has been. At least there's beer, and a chance to see what life is like aboard a boat. In the end, the tourism that is transforming rural China may save the fishermen and their way of life, and perhaps the Li River as well. And maybe even a foreigner or two. It was in Guiyin that I met Eric. He arrived by chance some seven years ago from Belgium and never left. He built a hostel for the first wave of independent travelers and watched Yangshuo grow into a bustling resort town of over 30,000 people. Since then, Eric has built two more upscale hotels and he's had three children. So what's it like to raise a family in rural China? It's so easy to raise kids here because you've got so much help from everyone. They're all potential babysitters, as it were. They love, they love kids. On their free day, they will ask us if they can take our kids out to the park and all that. That's on their free on their holiday. It's quite amazing. Since Eric's entire local family is Chinese, won't his children grow up speaking nothing but Mandarin? It motivates me to spend more time with my kids because I think it's very important that they, that they speak English. They won't necessarily have it from the schools here or from, um, yeah, from the teachers here, so... Balloon? Yeah. Balloon's inside. Yeah. Shall we get you a balloon? Oh, yeah. His advice? You've got to make choices in life. And it's all about priorities. You can't have it all at the same time. Uh, that's what we learn often here. I think people will more often uh, regret what they didn't do than what they do, really. Eric has no regrets. Neither does Alex. I met him in Thai City at his favorite sidewalk restaurant and was immediately invited to sit down and share a meal. Alex lives in a modest apartment complex on the 18th floor. His lifestyle is Spartan, to say the least. In fact, his one-room apartment only has one real piece of furniture in it. 
an enormous gaming system. It took him years to save up for it. Why did he do it? I like driving fast, but uh, in uh, real life, usually it's, it's very difficult. In some ways, Alex is a typical young Chinese man. Not very different from me. They all like new things, like uh, internet, Hollywood, big movie, <laughs> and computer game. But Alex wants more than that. At first, my dream is to be a pilot, but uh, because of my eyes, so my dream now is maybe travel all over the world oh, and uh, get married with a beautiful girl. Okay, so what are Chinese girls looking for? Wow, this is it's more difficult to, to answer because I'm single. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, rich enough. Yeah, definitely rich enough. Second, graduate in a good college. Alex deliberately seeks out foreigners to learn more about life outside of China and to discuss global issues. I think the air pollution is a serious problem. So if we can't solve this problem, I think our next generation will be a mess. The government for now, I think they did an excellent job. Military threat? Yeah, like Japan, like Vietnam. Yeah, and from American too. Yeah, they think we are enemy. <laughs> but we don't think we are your enemy. <laughs> Alex is thoughtful, curious, and easygoing. If this is China's future, the country is in good hands. But even Alex gets tired of urban China with its congested streets and yearns to breathe clean air. That's when he heads for nearby Taishan, the mountain of the gods. It's one of the five most sacred peaks in China, a deeply spiritual place, and very, very crowded. China's impressive economic growth has created a middle class with disposable income. Many of China's 1.3 billion citizens are starting to explore their own country. Tai is now the most visited mountain in China. To accommodate them all, the government has built a bus system to carry people to the top. But many still choose to climb the ancient stairway all 6,600 steps. It's four to seven grueling hours, straight up. Even after all that effort, they're still cheerful and friendly. Some know exactly what they're doing. Others may not have thought it completely through. Or chosen pretty. Over practical. Teamwork does seem to help. Parents have superhuman patience. It's the older folks who impress me most. Along the way, you can stop to read the sacred Chinese inscriptions carved into the mountainside. Over a hundred of them in all. Unless you're too wiped out to care. But not everyone is here just for the selfies. 
The monastery at the top is 800 years old. Many come to pray. And give offerings. Though even here, the modern world has managed to creep in. Reception is excellent. And if you're bored, there's half a dozen giant TV screens. The traditional soothsayer just can't compete. Leaving a lock behind will bring you luck if you can find space. Or you can tie a red ribbon to a pole or tree. The gods may grant your wish, especially if you leave a tip. Though you might want to save your hard-earned cash. When the fog rolls in, it gets very cold. And don't forget, you're going to be ravenous after all that exercise. Tomatoes, corn, cucumbers, not your standard Western fare. No wonder the Chinese are so healthy. Don't forget to try the famous Thai pancakes. It may seem strange to climb a mountain to buy a plastic toy, but China's one-child policy makes it hard to say no. And then it's time to start back down, which isn't necessarily any easier. The old trail is sadly off limits, though the modern signage is just as poetic as those ancient inscriptions. And suddenly, I understand why Tai Shan is so sacred. He climbs the mountain every week. He's 91. China is indeed a force to be reckoned with. Over a billion people, all trying to make a living, raise children, care for aging parents, play sports, and have fun. Just like us.